Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining and listening in. Welcome to the Commonwealth Learning Partnerships Policy and Advocacy Conversation Series designed to help Virginia educators and on-the-ground practitioners better understand and navigate education policy across Virginia and within individual policy contexts. For those not familiar with the Commonwealth Learning Partnership, it is a network of nonprofit organizations and schools of education across Virginia with a mission to modernize the Commonwealth's K-2 K through 12 education systems by providing edu the educational community with a variety of resources and tools. The Commonwealth Learning Partnership understands that educators and on the ground practitioners serve an essential role in helping design and inform equitable and practice informed policies in their regional areas. But far too often, educators and practitioners are missing from policy conversations and decisions. So today's conversation will provide educators and practitioners with insights on how they can effectively engage in policy and get a seat at the table with a particular focus on advocacy with the Virginia State Legislature. So who I am, I'm Erica Cuevas. Really quickly, I'm a senior policy manager at JFF. JFF is a national nonprofit organization that helps drive change across our nation's education and workforce systems. And we are a strong partner and supporter of the Commonwealth Learning Partnership. So today, again, today's conversation will be focused on effective advocacy strategies for engaging with the Virginia State Legislature. Listeners will be receiving great advice and tips for engaging legislative offices, and we'll hear from a set of experts directly from the legislature with in-depth legislative knowledge. So thanks again for being here and listening in. With that, I'm going to pass it to Julie from Capital Results, who will help kick off introductions and the conversation. So thank you. Thanks, Erica. So um, my partner, B. Gonzalez, and I um, are partners in a public affairs firm in Richmond called Capital Results, and we do a lot of policy work. B. does a lot of the direct lobbying for our clients, and I do more around the policy communications. So the two of us wanted to um, engage in a casual conversation with two of the key people in the Virginia Senate, the Virginia legislature, um, who help drive policy. Um, first is Janet Muldoon, who's the longtime chief of staff to Senator Dick Sasla, who is the Senate Majority Leader, and Jonathan Freeman, who is the chief of staff to the Senate Pro Tem, uh, Senator Louise Luke Lucas, who's also one of the very senior members of the Virginia Senate. Um, I think we just want to start first by um, asking both Janet and, and Jonathan to introduce themselves and just give us a little bit of background um, on your work in the Senate and, um, you know, we'll start from there. Janet, go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks a lot, Julie and B, uh, Jonathan and Erica. I appreciate the opportunity to share um, these little pearls of wisdom, or hopefully they'll be pearls of wisdom. Um, as you mentioned, I have been serving in my capacity with Senator Saslaw, who's the Democratic leader, for uh, at 22 years, believe it or not. And over the course of that time, he has always been in leadership. I have not um, had any other experience other than working for a um, in leadership. So our office has always had a very quick pace. Um, the Senator sits on major committees in the legislature, five of them, um, very frequently uh, he is in committee as opposed to being in his office. So when we get to that point in the um, conversation, you'll understand the role that, you know, a, um, a legislative aide will play. Uh, my own personal background is I uh, have a master's degree in political science. I originally taught. I have been a partner in a business and I have been, as I said, working with the Senator for many years. Um, and again, good policy is always the outcome. So thanks for the opportunity to be with you today. Thanks, Janet. Do you wanna, Jonathan, Jonathan, you wanna introduce yourself, please? Sure. Uh, first, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Jonathan Freeman. I'm Chief of Staff for the uh, President Pro Tempore of uh, the Virginia State Senate. Um, I've been uh, with Senator Lucas now. Uh, we were just laughing about this the other day. 
Uh, then I'm in my third year with her. I started off as her session aide, and I worked with uh, Delegate Sickles in the house for a year. And then Senator, uh, you know, and Mark talked about it. That brought me on back here to the Senate when uh, my predecessor went to work for uh, United States Senator uh, Mark Warner. Uh, so happy to be here in the Senate. Uh, this is my first year ever working in leadership. So I've been leaning on Janet uh, for her pearls of wisdom personally. Uh, you know, for her advice uh, on a lot of different things. I uh, went to Alabama State University. I graduated with a history and political science degree. Uh, and so um, some would say we're living the political science dream uh, working here in the Senate. Uh, so, uh, you know, Senator Lucas, uh, particularly, she sits, uh, when you add up her committees, boards, and commissions, uh, 31 things. And then if you add in there, uh, President Pro Tempore, she uh, does 32 uh, things in all, um, you know, when you add up uh, uh, boards, commissions, and committees. So uh, we are uh, sprinting all the time, uh, you know, so uh, just happy to uh, come here and, um, you know, give any advice that I can from my point of view. So thanks again for having me. Um, no, you go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I think that to, what we're trying to offer here is some insight to people who want to engage in the public policy process. So let's just start with um, Jonathan, why don't you just continue on and talk about what an effective, when someone comes to see you or writes to you or calls to you, what does an effective public advocate look like to you when, when they come and talk to you? Uh, great question. Uh, I would say that uh, an effective advocate uh, first knows uh, the issue uh, backwards and forwards, uh, the history of everything that they're talking about, where it began, uh, if it's uh, an issue that hasn't began yet, uh, meaning that it's not a law or it's not in the budget, um, and they would like to see it, uh, you know, uh, placed uh, in our society uh, here in the Commonwealth, uh, I would say to know um, how much it's going to cost is probably the most important thing. Um, you know, uh, what it's particularly going to do, uh, if it's going to affect one locality or several localities uh, or one community or a couple of communities or uh, which university specifically, uh, what is it tailored to? Um, what committee do you see it going to if it's not already uh, uh, been uh, placed in committee by uh, our wonderful uh, Senate clerk, uh, Susan Clark Shaw. Uh, you know, if it hasn't uh, 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 been placed there already, um, you know, where do you foresee it going? Uh, if you're not sure about that, then I would say it's best to talk to the legislative staff first. We can help you hash out all the details. Uh, and then, you know, we talk to the member um, from there uh, because, you know, uh, uh, as Janet will back me up, and as, as you all have uh, probably uh, seen, you know, talking to the members, uh, their time is very precious because uh, they're usually running from one meeting to another in the off season. Or if we're in session, they're running from one committee to the other uh, or they're running to the floor or if they're coming off of the floor, they're going back to committee. So, you know, usually the staff, we only have about 10 to 15 minutes to talk to them. Uh, ourselves uh, to, uh, you know, bring them up to speed on issues that we've talked to other advocates about. So, uh, you know, I find it extremely helpful to at least have a one pager uh, from the advocates uh, saying, you know, if, if it's in session, if it's a bill uh, that you're supporting or advocating against, what is that bill? What is the bill number? Is it a Senate bill or is it a House bill? Um, you know, and again, the facts surrounding it uh, as it pertains to how it's going to affect the budget. So Janet, I know you have thoughts on this too. So um, why don't you weigh in on your, your best advice to be a good and effective advocate? I think I will ditto what Jonathan just put out there. And I think, um, again, the more knowledgeable an individual is, and recognizing um, that we're there to be um, synthesize information. So if you're bringing in collateral material, 
do not bring in a 45 page document. So the one pager is critical. And I would also keep it to the, you know, um, you know, the high notes of the issue, if you will, as opposed to uh, getting in minutia because that's, there's gonna be opportunity for that. Uh, the minutia will come. Yeah, as Jonathan, I wanted to touch on something he had mentioned earlier, and uh, whether it's a Senate bill or a House bill. Before crossover, um, which is again something I'm not even sure that some of your listeners will understand or know what that is in the legislative process, if you're coming into a Senate office talking about a House bill that hasn't even been vetted, voted on or crossed over to the Senate chambers for uh, to be taken up, you're wasting a lot of people's time. And I say that, you know, um, very sincerely because a, a measure, if you're, you know, following a bill um, from the other chamber, that can go through many, many iterations before it comes over. So when you're going to, that's important, the timeliness of coming in on an issue. And I would submit to all of our listeners today that it's hard for us to give you a view of what our General Assembly is going to look like in, in you know, even in August, let alone what it's going to look like in January. Um, COVID has had many, many effects on just what what can or cannot be done in our buildings. Um, right now, our legislative offices are, are technically closed the, uh, where we do our work, and there's a good possibility that may be extended. I, I, so uh, it's going to be hard to do that. What I would also say, if there is something, you know, an issue, now is the time. Generally speaking, from our office, Again, as Jonathan points out, our members are on key committees, commissions, boards, and other um, things that take up their time. But we generally start looking into September, you know, right after Labor Day, and start meeting with advocates. We start meeting with, you know, um, people like yourselves that are carrying a message for a particular group they represent. So. I think timing is going to be critical. And again, I don't know the medium that we'll be using uh, in, the, in the fall. Will it be all <laughs> what we've grown accustomed to, these Zoom meetings? Or will we actually have the, you know, the capacity to be meeting with people safely in the fall? And I, and I think that's a lot of that is still up in the air. Um, I have a question um, for either one of you. Can you talk specifically about how your offices are set up? Because I think a lot of folks um, don't know how busy the members are. And so, you know, how many people are on your staff during session? Do you have interns that handle specific issues? And how, how, how you work as a team to kind of manage the, where everyone is at one time? I know Jonathan, you might want to answer this question. You've got a full staff over there. <laughs> sure, sure. So uh, during session, um, you know, when you added up all the people that were in our office, uh, we had about 10 to 11 people. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. I saw Janet's face. She popped up on my Zoom. Uh, but um, so uh, I was chief of staff. Um, we had Aja, who was our legislative aide. Uh, Tamisha Brim would come in about a day or two each week uh, to um, help out, but she was helping out remotely uh, already, um, you know, helping tab the emails to who they were supposed to go to because, you know, when we come in in the morning, we've got about a thousand emails, uh, no kidding, about a thousand emails from people all over the Commonwealth, not just uh, constituents or lobbyists uh, or uh, advocates, um, you know, we've got people of all ages, even people that are in high school, uh, you know, sending messages, uh, which we do appreciate uh, on what their opinion is uh, on certain uh, bills and what issues they want to see 
you know, our senator vote on uh, and which way they uh, want to see them, uh, you know, go. Uh, and so, uh, you know, Tamisha was uh, great in uh, uh, tabbing those emails. We also had interns uh, tabbing emails and printing things that uh, needed to go in certain binders. And uh, so for the most part, me and Aja took up the uh, uh, task of, uh, you know, meeting with various folks, uh, you know, that wanted to talk to the senator uh, and get a piece of their time, um, you know, but of course, uh, you know, starting early in the morning, bright and early at 7.30 a.m., Senator was chairing public safety uh, uh, subcommittee for finance, or she was uh, at education and health at 8 a.m. on a Thursday, uh, chairing that, uh, or she was in, uh, you know, the judicial uh, uh, committee, you know, or, you know, so it, it Senator and, and uh, uh, Senator Saslaw, uh, both of them were always running committee to committee. Uh, and then they needed to be at caucus and then be on the floor. And so, um, you know, and then they have their various subcommittees, of course. So, um, you know, it was imperative that we had a great team uh, and we did. Uh, and I'm very happy about uh, the way that we uh, got through session. And, um, you know, uh, Senator Lucas, I know, is uh, extremely happy about the way our team has uh, worked and continued to work together. We are not as large a staff, and bless your heart, you know, that's a lot of people to manage in addition to everything else we're doing. But, can, you know, you do it very well, you know. Um, the thing that I would say, you, 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 there are people in the office, um, in Senator Saslaw's office, we hire a session aide. We also uh, have interns that we work with, and we coordinate that work. As um, Jonathan points out, a huge chunk of input coming in daily are those emails. And one of the things that I would, you know, emphasize, it is always um, good to uh, reach out if you're a constituent. I think that's a priority um, view as opposed to um, any place in the Commonwealth just doing uh, um, uh, a, an email to the senators because an advocacy group has tapped you on the shoulder and said, put your name on this. So, and again, communication is um, pretty significant with us um, today. Uh, we also have administrative assistance just during session that, you know, in our particular office is handling the phones. And those people, um, you know, are, for us, are, that's incoming messaging. And we, get, we, we are looking at that toward the, an appropriate time of the day where we can either return calls or sort through that. Um, again, the priority goes to the constituent or to uh, the recognized authority that on a particular subject matter. Piggybacking on what you just said, Janet, um, you give priority to the constituent. Obviously, you check that against the database. They send you their address. So when they send you a communication, it's always good to have your address, where you live when you send it. Um, how do you manage the form letters and all the other communication? How do you count that? How do you, how do you equate for that in, you know, before committee meeting on a specific issue, for example? Okay. So I... Thank you for uh, bringing that to my attention. Generally speaking, we are seg uh, separating emails or, or sorting through them by an issue or by a bill. Um, then what is happening very frequently um, in my particular capacity, uh, Senator Saslaw's dockets are marked up for each committee. And um, there are notations from people that have, you know, dropped off information. Um, there are maybe, you know, I would basically at some point say 250 emails on XYZ, 10 of them were in district. So I had, you know, noted that, and that speaks for itself. And, um, you know, again, a lot of this information is, is, is you know, reading those bills, 
and preparing the dockets before they go into committee, as well as looking at those one pagers that we're talking about, because there's a highlight there that we may want to call to their attention when they go into committee. So Jonathan, can you um, also piggybacking on that issue about dockets, how does the Senator and the committee staff that she's with kind of manage a docket and how, you know, so advocates understand when a bill gets put on a docket, what that means and the work that goes on behind the docket setting of a committee meeting. I think that's something that most people don't realize. Absolutely. Uh, and before I answer, I would be awful to forget uh, Eunice, who uh, helped us manage the intern. She helped us train and manage the interns. So I, I'm super sorry for that. I hope she has it. Uh, uh, bite my head off for that one. So sorry. Uh, but, um, you know, what we had the interns specifically do, uh, you know, and I took a lot of the meetings with the lobbyists uh, when, uh, uh, you know, uh, whenever when there was an overflow, Aja would take uh, up the uh, meetings uh, with other lobbyists and advocates. And uh, I, we actually at one moment specifically had someone uh, meet with constituents. And when we would get these one pagers, what we would do is uh, you know, Senator loves her binders. Uh, and so uh, when we put these binders together, well, we had the interns put these binders together, uh, we would also uh, annotate in there under which bill, who supports what. Uh, we also had a Google spreadsheet of every single bill. This is a painful process because it's thousands of bills. Uh, but which particular group supports this bill? Which particular uh, group uh, is advocating against this bill? Uh, and for what various reasons. Uh, and so, um, you know, that's how we kept up with our one pagers. Uh, we also kept our one pagers in uh, a nice binder. Um, you know, they did start to stack up for the most part, um, which, uh, you know, they tend to do over the uh, either 40 or 60 days, uh, whichever it's a, a long session or short session year. Uh, but, you know, that's uh, how we kept up with that. Now, each committee, of course, uh, that uh, uh, a senator or delegate chairs, of uh, course, has their own committee staff. And so, you know, on a particular day, it was our job to, uh, you know, um, schedule those meetings with uh, the senator and the committee staff so that they uh, could uh, uh, come up with what that docket looked like for that particular uh, committee meeting uh, and how many days they needed to meet uh, in order to uh, meet um, you know, uh, their, their goal of X amount of uh, bills by crossover. Um, and so uh, that was uh, that process, um, you know, but it, it, it's, it's particular imp particularly important for, you know, these advocacy groups to come in again with these one pagers uh, and to keep it at one page because, you know, there are groups from all over the Commonwealth and uh, at times outside of the Commonwealth that come, uh, you know, with their own pieces of information. Um, and everyone is trying to uh, make sure that, uh, you know, they get, uh, you know, uh, what, what they would like to see happen to what particular bill uh, in those booklets, uh, or at least uh, in the Senator's hands, so. If, if I could add something about the docket meeting, um, and that's, that's what we refer to um, the, for the chairman that, that when they're meeting with the uh, committee staff, our docket meetings. Some of the bills, um, and maybe this is what you had in mind, be some bills, uh, they need to percolate a little bit. So they, they may drop at the beginning of a session but, uh, you know, the, the weeks go by before they're actually put on the docket. And I think there is a process to that. There's, you know, um, uh, some of these bills are non-controversial. Some of them you, you're going to have, as Jonathan said, advocates on both sides of the issue. Is, so they're looking for common ground. I, I know that often... Um, you know, there is uh, the need to compromise when you're writing good policy. Um, I think, I know my boss is, as a chair, he often looks for, to create a win-win 
as opposed to, you know, a great loser <laughs> and a great winner. So, and again, that's part of his style for creating policy. And, um, you know, people try to read in between the lines sometimes, oh, you know, they don't like my bill, they didn't put it on the docket. There might be something going on that, you know, people are trying to work out, which I'm sure you all could attest to that. Yeah, maybe it's a good time for me to just mention that we've thrown out a lot of terms like dockets and crossover and, you know, committee schedules and session dates and all of that stuff. Um, the Virginia General Assembly has a really good website and you can just Google Virginia General Assembly and all these terms can be found there and then you can go from there to either the House or the Senate. You can find all sorts of resources. It's, they're both really well done. Um, find calendars, find schedules, learn about the committees and um, all the things that they tackle. So I think that would be a good complement to this webinar is to um, familiarize yourself with terms and schedules and calendars. And Virginia has a very fast, and I think that's pretty clear from this discussion, a very fast session. They handle a lot of legislation, you know, always over 2,000 bills and sometimes pushing 3,000. I think we pushed 3,000 this year um, in either 45 or 60 days. And the entire state budget is just one bill. So in the years that we're doing the budget, that's when we're in 60 days. So understanding those kinds of terms and the pressures that are on the members um, is really important for folks that wanna engage in the process. And something, Janet, that you and I discussed the other day was um, the opportunities there are to meet with members when they're not in session. So as we kind of come to the end of our webinar, I just thought that that might be an opportunity worth maybe going into a little bit more and let people know they don't necessarily have to limit their interaction with you to just during the, the crush of session. I would say the, the, the biggest takeaway that I could give anybody is that this is based on relationships, based on credibility and timeliness. And I think establishing a relationship with an office and recognizing that, um, you know, each, Jonathan and I both, um, you know, our, our members choose us. We work directly for them. Um, they trust us and we have a sense of what they need um, for them to be successful as chairman, as, you know, legislators. So, I would think that you're right. Um, one of the things that um, I think that we, I would like to say is um, for people coming into the process, they, 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 what you just mentioned, having a resource to study up what some of that is, what is the legislative process, Civics 101 almost, but just they have the opportunity of how to be impactful. Um, I don't know if this is an appropriate time. I think there are probably some things that should be avoided when you're trying to communicate with a legislator. Is, is this where we talk about that? Okay. Go for it. Uh, Jonathan, stop me if I'm, you know, if I'm going in the wrong direction here. Um, I think that, you know, following a member down the hall, you know, kind of like when they're trying to get into their next, you know, mental frame when they're going to a committee, that is probably not the best time or the best way to, um, you know, influence that individual. I have seen literally um, people follow members into uh, restrooms, I have seen them follow them down a stairwell when, you know, the member could not get on an elevator because the building was so crowded. So going down the stairwell to get and then to, to be timely for their meetings. So there are certain things and certain, you know, boundaries that make you more effective, respecting, you know, their time, as well as trusting that the people that you are meeting with in their office have been empowered to carry your message. 
I think that's very good advice. Jonathan, do you have like a kind of a, a one important thing to remember that you want to wrap up with? Absolutely. Um, you know, to, to piggyback off of what, uh, you know, Janet was saying, you know, um, I, I think it gets tough, you know, because we get passionate about the issues. Uh, we get, uh, you know, uh, attached to a certain bill or a certain budget amendment that we would like to see go through. Um, you know, and there is certainly, uh, I mean, I think that if we could have uh, more daylight, you know, and be able to extend the day endlessly and, you know, talk to every single person, uh, you know, that we could um, as staff. And, you know, I know for members, uh, it's the same thing if they could talk to every single person, uh, you know, and, and um, you know, go from there. I think that everybody would do that. But unfortunately, uh, you know, um, I, I, I remember me and Janet, we get to the office about 6.30 a.m. every single day. And, uh, you know, we don't leave until about 7 o'clock at night. Uh, and for a lot of the members, especially members as senior as uh, Senator Lucas and Senator Saslaw, you know, a lot of times they're not leaving the building until, geez, I mean, it gets, it, they get in, it's dark, they leave and it's dark. and I think uh, it, it's hard, you know, when you you start to get attached again to these uh, potential laws and and potential budget amendments that you would like to see go through, and we lose sight of the fact that you know our senators and our delegates are also people. They also have good and bad days. They also have their days where they're coming into the general assembly and they're not feeling well, or you know they may be under the weather. And so I think taking those things into the account. Um, you know, uh, when you're uh, going up to the General Assembly building to advocate for certain issues, it's, uh, it's a great, um, um, you know, thing to do. It, uh, you may not be able to catch them, you know, for those five, ten minutes when they're walking to the first floor to go to the committee or when they're going to, uh, you know, uh, the Capitol building. But I think, um, you know, it, it would be much appreciative uh, everyone to you know take into account that you know we're all people you know and i think when you look at it that way and say okay well i'm just going to make my appointment and uh, uh you know get my time in there when they're in the office or with the legislative staff and um go from there i think you get farther on the issues that you want to see go through uh, and uh you know like janet said i think that's where coming uh, into a legislative office and building relationships with the staff helps you out tremendously because it builds up trust. And you say, I know that the senator, or I know the delegate is going to get that information because I've worked with these people throughout the year. And, you know, they're, they're going to do what they're supposed to do with the information that is given. So. I had one thought process. If we go back into our Pocahontas,